and to you all plugged in from around the world to listen and interact with me on John Mahama Live. I've been going around the country and I meet with many individuals and business groups to discuss matters of concern to them. And I read and follow the many issues that are raised on my posts here on Facebook and Twitter. I therefore thought it wise to dedicate a period to interact without any protocols with you. And I think this platform is a good start. If you have any questions or contributions to make after my short presentation, I invite you to send them, and I'll answer as many as I can before this session ends at 6 p.m. Just remember to add the hashtag, hashtag John Mahama Live to your post. So my brothers and sisters, since the coming into office of the akufuado led administration, we've witnessed certain developments that have shaken the very foundation of our people's confidence and trust in the whole financial system. Actions aimed squarely at the indigenous and homegrown banking sector have ushered in a new age of financial exclusion for the already squeezed Ghanaian. Among others, we've seen the licenses of nine universal banks revoked. Others have been merged. Finance houses and savings and loans companies have also had their licenses withdrawn. And 347 microfinance and 39 microcredit institutions have been shut down. Indeed, we are told that the central bank has so far closed 420 financial institutions that it deems insolvent. The crisis has created major problems in the banking and financial sector including deepening the already widely held mistrust and lack of confidence in the system by many Ghanaians. And there appears to be no end in sight. It has also dealt a significant blow to the indigenous banks because such institutions usually have no external support to count on. While this development may appear as a threat to only the businesses that have been shut down, it is in fact a threat to our national security. Indeed, as has been widely touted, ownership of capital matters. The ethnicity of capital is real, and the banking sector and financial system of a country are part of its national security architecture. The developments in the banking and financial system and the matters arising call for great concern for all who have been affected by this financial sector turmoil, especially because it is an issue that threatens our country's national security. We must all be worried about the businesses that have collapsed, the licenses that have been revoked, the massive job losses, the hardship this is causing to some customers, and the trauma of having their lifetime savings in jeopardy. There's also the consequence on the health and well-being of customers and workers, including honoring their obligations as parents by providing for their families and dependents, paying school fees of their wards, and paying rent in order to give their families decent and safe places to lay their heads among others. These are trying times, indeed. And as a leader of the main opposition party, I cannot look on and consent. We cannot look on without our voices being heard and without being on the side of the many people who may be agonizing over the situation because they have lost their capital investments, they've lost their lifetime savings, their jobs, their businesses, or the fear that their deposits are in jeopardy and are therefore uncertain about their future and that of their families. Those who've been hardest hit by these unfortunate developments include especially market women, artisans, cocoa farmers, and the many operators in the informal sector of the economy whose hard work and yet modest earnings oil the wheels of our national economy. In all, it is estimated that more than 20,000 people have already lost their jobs 
as a result of the financial sector shutdowns. The number could be even higher when you take into account the indirect job losses occasioned by this crisis. Apart from the livelihoods lost, the resolution cost of nearly 20 billion Ghana cities, as we are told, ultimately becomes a burden on the Ghanaian taxpayer. This comprises the 12 billion for the universal banks that were shut down, another 7 billion provided and expected to be used for the saving and loans institutions and finance houses, and approximately another 1 billion for the microfinance institutions. The current provisions made for the debt in the mid-year review budget amounts to about 3% of GDP. And will, together with the fresh debt incurred in the energy sector over the period of the Akofado administration, put the fiscal deficit above 11%. And it will move Ghana closer to the debt distress threshold of 60% debt to GDP ratio, even with the rebased figures. There are many valid questions to ask, including whether the revocations and the mass closures were the best options under the circumstances, or whether there were no other options available to resolve the problem. What part did the debt owed by government to its contractors and suppliers play in the insolvency of these financial institutions? And to what extent did the utterances and posturing of the central bank create panic that resulted in a run on many of these financial institutions. It is tried knowledge that no bank or financial institution, no matter how big, can survive if there is a rush on investments, especially when induced by the pronouncements of policymakers or regulators. We can also ask what role did the macroeconomic challenges and energy sector crisis of the past several years have on the slide into insolvency of some of these banks? And what due diligence did the Bank of Ghana do on the situation before commencing these closures? This is not the first time Ghana has faced a crisis in our financial sector. The Financial Sector Adjustment Program, popularly called FINSA, during the 1990s, used the Non-Performing Assets Recovery Trust, NPAT, as a vehicle to offload the toxic liabilities of the banks and clean out the financial sector. During the world financial crisis, it was not uncommon that many countries, because of the strategic nature of their domestic financial institutions, provided bailouts in exchange for equity in order to prevent a chaotic meltdown of their financial sectors. As it is, our central bank chose the path of a chaotic resolution and has created grave social and commercial dislocation with an accompanying huge debt that government have, has no clue how to even begin paying down. The policy working group on finance and economy that I set up recently is studying and analyzing the situation with a view to coming up with pragmatic steps that we can employ not only to restore the confidence of our people in the banking system, but also to ameliorate the suffering imposed on the customers and staff of these financial institutions caused by the poor handling of the crisis by this administration. The policy working group will also come up with plans for restoring the indigenous stake and participation in this all important sector. We'll consider ways to promote greater financial inclusion and innovation, and consider setting up an appropriate vehicle to regulate microfinance and allied sectors in particular, while developing the rural banking sector and enhancing the role of the ARB Apex Bank's supervisory structure. A future NDC administration will assess the effectiveness of the regulatory architecture and identify gaps as well as the needed reforms to promote greater financial stability and growth. We'll also consider temporary freezing of new banking licenses for a period of time while encouraging as many banks as possible 
to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange within a reasonable time frame. We'll look at the receivership and liquidation framework in the Act to make it easier for the administrator to reverse a decline rather than making it automatic for an insolvent bank to be liquidated. While at it, we call on the Akufuado administration to lift the veil on the beneficial shareholders of the Ghana Amalgamated Trust and to curb its supposed predatory bailout assault on the remaining banks, which include state-owned banks. Meanwhile, I wish to assure all those who have suffered in one way or the other as a result of the approach being used by the current administration that we stand by you and we're working very hard to take over the governance of our beloved country in 2021 and to bring certainty, financial security, progress and prosperity to all Ghanaians, irrespective of their ethnicity, their family, religion or political affiliation. Thank you very much and I'll now go through your contributions and questions and answer them. The hashtag to use, remember, is hashtag John Muhammad Life. Isaac Obo, I see you're watching from the USA. And the question is, what will you do with this situation if given the opportunity? Isaac, thank you very much. Indeed, like I said, Closures and revocation of licenses are a last resort when nothing else can be done. I believe that the better option is to look at how the situation can be salvaged. It is only when you have nowhere else to turn that you resort to closures and revocation of licenses. The current revocation of licenses and closures has caused mass dislocation and has created very serious implications for credit financing of our small and medium enterprise sector and it's going to take several years for us to climb out of it. I gave the example in the 1990s when we had toxic liabilities in most of our financial sector. What happened was the government of the day created what we call <clears throat> a bad bank and offloaded all the toxic liabilities into the bad bank. It was called the Non-Performing Assets Recovery Trust. And it cleaned out the balance sheets of the banks. It put in better regulatory measures. And then the bad bank went after the debts that it had inherited and most a lot of the money was recovered and it went back to the government purse. Now as it is, 20 billion Ghana cities is the debt of this clean out and the taxpayer, you and I, have to pay this money. I believe that there's a lot that government could have done. For instance, the questions I asked, how much did government owe its contractors and suppliers, which if government had paid Will it have made some of the banks liquid enough to continue to operate? And the point you even have to ask is, how much did they owe each other? Because there are cases where microfinance companies owed savings and loans companies. There are cases where savings and loans companies owed uh, banks, universal banks. How did we net off all these before going to revoke licenses? As it is, we are saddled with a fait accompli. And we need to see how this can be handled in, with, with regards to the impact that it has had, not only on the financial sector, but on the customers whose monies are locked up, on the staff who thought they had lifetime employment, but suddenly find that their employment is ended, on the staff who are being ejected from their uh, 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 rented premises, and who face serious dislocation of their lives as a result of the steps that have been taken. We would have handled it in a different way. We would have done a proper analysis of the situation and revocation of licenses would have been a last resort, not a first resort. Um, Silas Mana, um, you said I should not talk about the banking sector because the mess may have started from my regime. Thank you very much uh, for your question. As I've said, no country is immune from crisis in the financial sector. We noticed the beginning of the crisis 
while we were in government, and we started taking proactive steps in order to deal with it. The first was the Energy Sector Levy Act. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's called ESLA. Because the main threat to the banking sector in our time was the debt that was owed to the bulk distribution companies. I hope you remember them. They were called the BDCs. And they were the major threat to the stability of the financial sector. And so we put the Energy Sector Levy Act, which was a tax on petroleum products, and it was supposed to deal with the legacy energy sector debts. This levy, as I talk, yields almost 4 billion CDs every year. And so at the time, with a debt that we realized at 2.2 billion, we knew that the money from the energy sector levy would be able to pay down the cost uh, of government's uh, indebtedness to the banking sector. This energy sector levy is still available. It yields, even with the recent increase, it will yield about 4 billion a year. The question to ask is, how has this government used that money? Because if this government has used that money prudently, then money should be available to be able to address the issues to do with the energy sector. Apart from that, there were several acts that we put in place. The Deposit Insurance Act was passed by Parliament in my time. And the purpose of that act was to ensure every person's deposit so that in the event that there's a meltdown of any financial institution, because the deposits have been insured, the insurance companies will make good any monies that have been lost as a result of that. And so there were several steps that were put in place. And I believe that as the minority, we should have a say in what has happened currently. Um, Hamida Abdul Wahabi asked, please, what measures will you put in place to facilitate the construction of deplorable commercial roads linking farming communities. I believe that our road network carries the bulk of our transportation. It indeed is the bulwark of our transportation because if you compare, if you compare it to rail and aviation and maritime, then the road network is the most used in our country. And so it's important that we have roads that are able to facilitate the movement of passengers and goods across our country. Realizing that we did not have enough money in the budget to finance the road sector, we decided in the Energy Sector Levy Act to increase the amount of money that went to the road fund. And as I speak, that uh, provision makes about 1.5 billion CDs available to government every year to not only maintain the roads, but to develop new roads. Aside from that, we introduced the COCO Roads Improvement Project. And that was supposed to take a part of the yearly consortium financing for COCO to develop and repair the roads in the five COCO growing regions. And I'm sure that everywhere, everybody in the country saw some improvement in their roads you know, during the period that I was president. I think that we can revive these projects. A lot of the projects had contractors working on them. And the point you need to know is that contractors do not finish a project in one year. And so they present certificates. And as they present certificates, government continues to pay. And so I believe that if government organizes itself properly, it should be able to continue to work on our roads and improve them so that we have a good road network that not only transports agricultural products, but also makes it possible for passengers and goods to move freely across our country. Um, Salia Abdullah is asking why he should choose me over Nanado. Will I run a better economy and take better decisions to benefit our people? I believe that every government faces its challenges. I faced my challenges. I faced a legacy problem um, of the energy sector where we did not have enough generation. We were consuming in excess of 2,000 megawatts, and yet the generation available to Ghanaians was less than 2,000. It was 1,500 megawatts. I did not push the blame to past governments. I took the bull by the horns. Every government a president must take responsibility. And I said, I'll solve the problem. And indeed, we went to work. And by 2016, we had put in enough generation so that for those who remember, in 2016, Dumso had been uh, completely sorted out. 
There were other challenges with the economy, and I found it necessary as leader to take a decision to go back to the IMF and do a program so that we could bring some discipline into the management of our finances. And for those who will remember, by 2016, this economy was climbing out of the macroeconomic challenges that we had faced. One of the decisions I took was to fast track our revenues from oil production. So I worked on the 10 field, I worked on the uh, uh, ENI Sankofa field, and the revenues came after my turn. Indeed, this government is receiving four times more oil revenue than I did because of the work we did in our time. We received 960 million Ghana CDs from all the oil that we exported. This government receives more than 3 billion CDs in oil revenues, and I think that they should be able to manage better with the increased revenues that we made available to them. And um, I believe that there are things we can do to make this economy better so that it works for everybody and makes opportunities available to all. And um, Hackings Glover wants to know what I'll do in the first year of my next term to tackle the challenges facing the banking sector. One of the things we need to do in order that we do not have a recurrence of this crisis in the financial sector is that we must look at the responsibility of the central bank in terms of its banking supervision. As you are aware, we sent a new Bank of Ghana Act to Parliament which was passed. That gives the central bank independence from anybody's control. But I do think that because we continue to have these recurrences with regards to regulation and supervision of the banking sector, we need to take a look at the Bank of Ghana Act again and see if we cannot put in place a specialized vehicle that will have the day-to-day -day administrative task of supervising the financial sector to make sure that some of the you know, leverages that people took that resulted in this situation are kept or that we have an early warning system so that we can deal with these issues before they create the kind of uh, situation that they've created. And so that's one of the things we'll look at. In the first few months of coming into office, we'll look at the Bank of Ghana Act again and see how we can improve banking uh, um, regulation and supervision. Um, Isha, Isa and others watching from Jirapa. And I say hello to all the people in Jirapa. Thanks for uh, joining in. And Ishak says, um, this is good leadership. No, that's Emmanuel McLean. This is good leadership, says Emmanuel McLean. Thank you, Iman. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, Beauty Amor says, I agree with your comment that businesses are collapsing and that it's leading to a high rate of unemployment. That is true. From, our, from the rough estimation that we have, about 20,000 people have lost their jobs directly if you take all the category of the 420 uh, financial institutions that have collapsed. But we've not even added the indirect job losses because right now as I speak, there are small and medium enterprises that depended on the banks and the microfinance institutions for capital to continue to do their business. And now because of the collapse of these um, institutions, they are unable to get that credit to be able to do their business. Others have their uh, capital locked up in these institutions. And so as a result of that, layoffs are occurring. And so by the time we do the total calculation, I'm sure that in excess of 40 to 50,000 people, you know, probably would lose their jobs because of this financial sector meltdown. Um, Mr. Mahama, can we trust you to do the things you're saying about the financial sector? and the economy, Alex Bafo. Alex, I'm a person who takes responsibility, and I give the example with the energy crisis. I believe that government should be sincere and take responsibility. I mean, after three years of being in power, what use is it to continue to blame your inability to deliver on the previous government? People take a decision to entrust you with the responsibility of running the country. Yes. Actions of previous governments might create difficulties for you, like I, I inherited, like Pre President Mills inherited, like President Kofor inherited. Nobody inherits a country where there are no challenges, but you must take the responsibility to deal with those challenges. And I am a person who takes responsibility. If I take the helms of this country, I will assess, I'll tell the people of Ghana 
what it is I have inherited and what steps I'm going to take to deal with them, like I did in my previous term in office. Um, Mohammed, let's see who's this. Suleiman Yahaya says, Mr. President, we miss you a lot, so we're working hard to bring you back in 2020, inshallah. Um, Alhamdulillah, Mohammed, Mohammed, thank you very much. And I believe that let's all work together and um, create the prosperity and dignity that we want for this country. Um, Mohammed Yunus says again, I want you to talk about the energy sector. Mohammed, this is a start. This is the first interactive session. I intend to make this a regular feature. And on each occasion, I will take an aspect of our economy or of our lives and I'll deal with it and interact with, with as many people as I can. So this is on the financial sector. The next time we can talk about ed education, the next time we can talk about energy. And so this is going to be a regular feature. It's not a one-off. Um, Mickey says, how will you regulate the banking sector as a tough leader? The responsibility for regulating the banking sector rests primarily with the central bank. But of course, government is not divorced you know, from the effects that will happen if that regulation is not carried out well. And that's why I'm saying that as president, I'll take another look at the Bank of Ghana Act and we will create a special purpose vehicle that has the day-to-day -day responsibility of regulating that sector in order that what we're seeing today does not happen again. And so that's one of the things that uh, we, can, we, we can do. Um, Ademu says, um, please, we want Radio Gold and Muntia back on air. I think it's a pity that these two stations have been taken off. The authorities are hiding behind regulation and law, but at, in the end, it is about free speech and it's about press freedom. I believe that Dana Akufado, who touts himself as a human rights advocate and an advocate of free expression and free speech, must feel very embarrassed about the closure of these two stations. The bottom line is that these stations are deemed to be anti-government and pro-opposition. And that's the main reason behind their closure. The authorities are hiding behind the law and everything. The duty of regulation, when it has to do with the rights and freedoms of people, is not to vitiate those rights, it is to create a, a, a situation where you are able to correct any um, infractions of the law that have taken place. And so if Radio Gold and XYZ have infracted the law, the duty of the NCA is to assist them to come within the ambit of the law. And so give them a period and tell them that within this period, we want you to come back, you know, uh, uh, in, in, on the side of regulation. But to just shut them off, they go to the electronic tribunal, the, um, uh, the head of the tribunal has resigned. Government will not, I can tell you, government is not going to appoint a new judge for that tribunal because they don't want the cases to be heard. And so XYZ and Radio Gold have been shut because the president thinks that they are saying things that he does not like. And I believe that it, it does not help, it does not help our democracy. I was, I was criticized by many journalists and many stations. But the point is, if you want to consolidate our democracy, you must have a big heart to accept criticism. Unfortunately, this president cannot accept criticism. Our press freedom credentials are on the downslide. Journalists don't feel safe. If you attack government, people come after you. I think it's a very, very bad narrative that um, this government is taking us through. Recently, uh, Professor Kari Kari, my former professor in the university, um, of uh, Medium Foundation for West Africa fame said that this government's credentials in terms of press freedom are, are, are bad. And so I think that the president should wake up and listen and um, do something about it. Um, uh, 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 uh. There's a leader who digs down to the issues thoroughly, says Senior Saeed. Thank you very much, uh, Saeed. Um, I hope you enjoyed the salon. <clears throat> uh, Faculty Mane says, do you mean your policies are still not ready? Well, what happens is, for every election, we put our policies before the people. And we do it in the form of a manifesto. I must tell you that we have policy working groups that are working 
to come out with the manifesto that we'll present to Ghanaians. I'm working closely with them, and so I know what work is ongoing, and I know many of the policies that are coming up. As I go around the country, I talk about them. Um, recently, when I was at the, Ghana, um, um, the uh, Union of Technical Students, I talked about free SHS, I talked about technical and vocational education. And so, yes, I'm on top of the policies, but we'll put it together and present it to Ghanaians as a comprehensive policy document in all sectors when we present our manifesto to the people of Ghana for the 2020 elections. Um, Dumedi George Wilson says, thank you for this initiative, Mr. President. You should do this often. What is your take on the new education curricula reform being worked on by the MPP? Our policy working group on education has flagged this issue because the curriculum is key to the quality of education that our people have. I think that more consultation should take place. Recently, I heard there was a workshop to present the curricula to teachers, and there was a fallout in respect of allowances and all that. But I hope that that is part of the process of consultation so that all of us can have an input. One of the major decisions I've had is that teachers who were responsible for social studies say that the social studies subject has been taken out of the curriculum. We need to look at it and see what the issues are. There are also changes in some of the syllabi that try to reform the history of our country. I think that these are things that all of us must look at and there must be public engagement so that we know what our children are learning in school and to make sure that they'll come out to be dignified and responsible citizens of our country. Um, let's see who's next. Um, Prosper Mensa asks, the Vice President Baumia has consistently been uncivil when talking about you, but you never respond. Are you going to remain silent for him to deride you? I've been in politics or in public service since 1996, and that is almost 23 years ago. I believe that we must always be responsible in our discourse and that we must be civil in the way we address each other. And so I'm not a person who will go deriding anybody. I try to maintain the discourse at a level where people will listen and the descending Ghanaians can make a choice. And so it doesn't matter who is uncivil to me or who abuses me or who throws insults at me. I know he calls me the incompetent one or something like that, but it doesn't really bother me. I think that the people of Ghana are descending and they can tell, you know, I mean, the contribution that I've made to um, our uh, public services since I've been in politics. I'll continue to respond as civilly and courteously as possible. And I think that it's for all politicians uh, to learn. Politics need not be dirty. We can uh, play politics at a level that allows people who have the competence to come into it. It's when it, 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 it descends into insults that makes people who have the capacity to come and help run our public services want to stay away from politics. And so let's make it clean so that everybody can come in and participate. Um, who's next? Koji Klo Nene. You had far-reaching policies, but unfortunately, it wasn't broken down for it to resonate. Uh, yeah, you are more sincere in my opinion. Yes, Koji, the thing is, that has been one of the major difficulties of public service. When you lead a country, you have a vision, and you come out with policies that will help you attain that vision. How to communicate that vision is one of the major difficulties that governments face. And so it is one of the regrets I have that with the policies that we churned out in education, in the health sector, and all that, we did not you know, um, um, uh, sell that to the people in a manner that they could understand. And so people could see hospitals being built, but they did not understand the policy driving, bringing health to your doorstep, which was the policy that we were, 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 were carrying out. And so I think the next time we will improve government communication so that people can, at every step of the way, know what government is trying to implement. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Moses Kanduri, 
He says, I'm interested in the strategy to support financial technology, fintech in Ghana, to be competitive in Africa and the world. I think that that is, is, is important, and I believe that is an area that you should continue uh, to pursue. If we must make Ghana more competitive, then we need to actually um, follow uh, financial technology and make sure that we're able to make it more meaningful within the context of what we do in the financial sector. Um, let's see who's next. Julius Ni, um, how did you solve the banking uh, issues when you were in office. Like I said, when we were in office, the greatest threat to the banking sector was the issue of the legacy debt from energy. These were debts that had accumulated from as far back as President Rawlings' time through President Kofor's time to, um, to um, President Mills' time. And the debt to BDC is a loan because companies had had to give them letters of credit which they had defaulted on was threatening the stability of the banks. And so that's why we introduced the Energy Sector Levy Act. And I remember at the time we introduced it, our colleagues uh, in opposition were very opposed to it. They said we were overtaxing Ghanaians, and that as soon as they came, they were going to remove the ESLA. Unfortunately, <laughs> or should I say fortunately, they came into office. And the ESLA is not only very much alive. Indeed, just recently in the media review, they have increased it. And the question we want to ask is, what is the ESLA being used for? Is it being used for the purpose that we introduced it? You know, this was brought as a special purpose vehicle to be able to raise monies to pay down the energy sector debt. Since we left, the ESLA has increased in, in, in how much it brings in, from 3.5 billion to almost 4 billion or more every year. And so if it is being used exactly for what it's meant for, it should be able to pay down the legacy debt. But I think that some reforms are needed in the financial sector, especially in relation to regulation and supervision, so that we don't have a recurrence of these financial sector meltdowns. Um, let's see who's next. Um, Kweku Sechi Akomia. And Kweku Sechi Akomia says, we have one of the best security measures during your tenure is West now. How best can you help with security in your next tenure? Um, I think that one of the things about security and one of the things that I did when I was president is to put the right people at the right places. If you put politics above merit in the security sector, you will have the results that we are facing now. I don't think that the government has followed merit in terms of appointments in the security services. And so the result is what we're seeing. There are people who have the ability to deal with uh, some of these security issues. When I was president, I looked at people who could solve a situation and I sent them to the places where they could be effective. And I, I believe that security and people, I mean, people, Ghanaians felt safe and secure, you know, under uh, my, my tenure because of the work the security services uh, did. Um, we had the anti armed robbery squads, we had um, various, you know, uh, specialized units that dealt with issues of crime and security. And one of the things I introduced was the visibility police. On every street corner, you could see a police uh, officer. Today, I mean, you don't see police officers on the streets. You don't see them in the corners. The visibility police seems to have disappeared. Just the fact that the police are out and about makes the criminals, you know, very careful before they execute anything that is untoward. And so these were some of the things we introduced, visibility police, community policing and all that. And I believe that there are many other, you know, things that we can bring to make Ghanaians feel safe and secure in their own country. Um, Adams Ahmed, you're watching from Accra. Um, you want to know what policy, policies I would recommend to get private businesses to become the engine of growth. I believe that they must not only be the engine of growth, and it's not only private businesses. I believe that indigenous Ghanaian private businesses must be the engine of growth. If you look at the contribution of the Ghanaian private sector to our GDP, 
compared to the 70s, it has fallen. In the 70s, the contribution of the Ghanaian private indigenous sector was above 50% of GDP. Today, the assessment has not been made, but I believe it's far less than 50%. And so we need to see how, and I'll use the words of uh, General Achampong, we can make Ghanaians capture again the commanding heights of our economy. It is only when we do that, that we will be able to um, um, uh, grow this country and the private sector. I tried to do it in the road sector. When I took over as president, there were many foreign uh, construction companies doing all the roads, even using our budgetary uh, finances. By the time I left, there were at least 22 big Ghanaian construction companies with their equipment stock even bigger than from some of the foreign companies. We must do this not only in the construction sector, in the building construction sector, in agriculture, in mining, and all that. And so that's one of the things that I believe if I become president again, I will promote Ghanaian business. Yes, foreign direct investment is important, but I think that first and foremost, we must let our own people dominate the oil sector. They must dominate the petroleum sector, the mining sector, because when they make profit, that profit stays in Ghana. If we rely too much on FDI, when the foreigner makes profits, every April, May, he says, I've made this profit, I want to send it back to my country. And that's part of the reason why our foreign exchange continues to fluctuate. But we'll talk about that at another time when I speak about the economy. As Amitita Maklou um, is saying, if given the chance, are you also going to have an elephant-sized government? I think two days ago I spoke about it, and I recommended to the president that he should reduce the size of his government by about 40 ministers immediately. He can let 40 ministers go. It will not have any effect at all <laughs> on, on, on the current performance uh, of his government. But I think that one is symbolic, and then two, the impact it has. It's symbolic because when Guardians are going through difficulty, and you come with a government the size of 125 ministers, which I'm told is a Guinness World Record um, amongst all countries, we have the biggest uh, uh, number of ministers, then people, I mean, feel that you're not taking them seriously. But aside from that, I mean, if you consider 40 ministers and you take some of the portfolios, procurement, you have a procurement minister. Meanwhile, look at the issue we have with procurement. I mean, <laughs> uh, the recent issue uh, Manasseh has come out with procurement with a procurement minister. You have monetary and evaluation. You have planning. When there's a whole National Development Planning Commission, you know, you have aviation railways, which could all have been submerged into transport. I mean, so there are things that we will do. I mean, if I become president again, I'll imagine, merge all these ministries. Sanitation will go back to local government. I believe that can be handled there. You know, aviation and railways will go back into transport. Half of business development, procurement, and all those other uh, ministries, they will just be scrapped completely and will drastically reduce the size of government. I believe that the government and the nation can run with a smaller number of ministers than we currently have. Um, let's see, we have some more time, so let me see who's next. Henry Abutu, looking at the over 20 billion to be spent, don't you agree that the cost of collapsing these financial institutions could have been used to do same? Indeed, some people have come to say that we could have bailed out these financial institutions with a fraction of the 20 billion that we're going to spend to um, um, clean up. And I don't know how much, but if we had 20 billion to spend, I don't believe that these uh, institutions would have gone under. And so that's, those, that's why I asked all those questions. And I mean, part of the problem, I said, like I said, if you create panic in the system, no bank can survive because what banks do is they take deposits and they operate on the principle that not everybody who's deposited money with them will come for their money on the same day. And so they lend some to people. So at any one time, banks are exposed because they have money that they've lent to people. And not everybody will come for his money the same day. And they create what we call creation of credit if you study economics. And so if the regulator creates a panic situation by the pronouncements he makes, you must reach 400 million capitalization by this thing, or else I'm going to shut you down. And then every day you open the bank doors, and everybody is going and taking his money. Any bank will collapse. Even Barclays, if everybody goes there today and takes his money, Barclays Bank will collapse. 
And so what kind of situation did we create? You know, that led to uh, what, what happened. But I think that it's crying over spilt milk. We are landed with a 20 billion debt and it's become uh, the debt of the taxpayer. Um, Seduji Goji and says, uh, what policy will your next government put in place to protect financial institutions against non-performing loans? Um, in my time, we introduced the Credit Reference uh, Agency or Bureau so that if somebody applied for a loan, the uh, banking sector could ask the Credit Reference Bureau. That will look and see if the person has defaulted on loans from other banks before. And that will all guide whether they give the loan or they don't give the loan. And so that's one of the things that we introduced. And so the credit reference system is available today. I also talked about the Deposit Insurance Act that we passed. And the Deposit Insurance Act was meant to insure all deposits. And so all banks were required to insure uh, the deposits of their customers. So that in the event that the bank went under the insurance companies would um, uh, be responsible for um, um, reimbursing whatever losses were done. Then apart from that, I said banking supervision must be strengthened. This is not the first time. It has happened and it has it happened again. If banking supervision is not strengthened, it, it's possible that because of Bank of Ghana's monetary policy and all that, they do not have enough time to look at banking supervision and regulation properly. And so a special vehicle that will prioritize banking supervision is something that I would work on if I become president again. Um, Abdul Hamid he says, it's great to see you're taking advantage of social media. My question is, have you noticed the high cost of data and what are your plans towards making internet affordable for all? Well, Hamid, you know I was Minister of Communications before. And um, one of our um, uh, objectives in all this liberalization that took place and the IT revolution uh, was to make you know, telecommunications and IT affordable uh, for all people. Um, unfortunately, the cost continues to go high, also because of the taxation that is put on it. Recently, government has increased the communication service tax again. And so that affects both tele um, uh, voice calls and data. And so what we need to do is to see how we can cut down costs as much as possible. The more you have traffic, the more cheaper the costs become. We worked on the infrastructure when I was a minister in order that we could have you know, uh, voluminous traffic. We were responsible for all the subsea cables, you know, optic fiber cables that were put, and then we were laying optic fiber across the whole country in order to create the infrastructure so that data can move as fast as possible. And we believe that investment in the infrastructure can help to bring down uh, the cost. But we must also look at the taxes and other things that come uh, with these uh, telecommunications. Um, it says, tell... I, I, I can't see the name. They say, tell the story about how you sent mobile phone service to the North as Minister of Communications. Um, when mobile services uh, came, um, you had the, the YAMS, the very big phone. I remember when Mobitel first um, issued phones. It was a very huge phone, and that's when the catchphrase, Mitya Bonting and Amekasa came up. And it was mainly in the southern part of the country. And so one of the times I went to the north and um, my mobile phone wasn't working because the mo mobile companies did not believe that there was a market in the north. And so I challenged them and the, uh, at that time the chief executive of Mobitel, he told me that if you can get me 100 customers who will subscribe to our uh, mobile phones, if I put a mask in Tamale, I'll immediately go and put a mask in Tamale. So I went to my friends, I grew up in Tamale, and I said, if you get a mobile phone, would you want it, would you use it? He says, yes. So I collected 100 signatures, names, addresses, and everything, and I went and gave it to the Mobitel manager at the time. I said, look, I have 100 customers for you, so go put your mask there. And so he did. And all the 100 people or more, by the time they put the mask, there were like 300 people waiting for phones. 
And that is how Tamale got uh, mobile services. And then, of course, from there, we got um, uh, Ghana Telecom to also put masks in places, and then mobile services spread across the whole country. Um, Charles Nyame from Asamankasi, he says, what's the secret behind your honesty? You never fear to tell the truth to people. I think that that should be at the bottom of our politics, that we must be frank to our people and let them understand what the challenges are. Because it's only when people understand the challenges that you're dealing with in government that they can empathize with you and have the uh, uh, ability to sacrifice in order that we all build a better Ghana. And so I'll continue to be as frank as I can. I'll continue to tell the truth to people. Um, in the last election, um, I say we faced what we call a, an incumbency disadvantage because I knew what the economy could take. And I knew that some of the lofty promises being made you know, could not be supported by the state of the economy at the time. I met people who said, oh, well, MPP is promising. So you to promise anything. After all, it's the political power you want. But when you have the power and you're faced with delivery on the promises, what do you do? And so I'll always tell the truth to the people of Ghana. If I get voted to serve, I'll serve. And it's left to the people to, to, to decide. Um, well, it's already one hour, and I've enjoyed this session uh, very much. The questions and comments were dropping so fast, but I'm happy I answered as many of them as, as I could. Um, as I said, this is not the last interaction. This is just the first. Um, I'm going to try and interact with you on as varied topics as possible, uh, education, agriculture, economy, you know, healthcare, and so um, we'll, 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 we'll interact again. And for those of you who uh, could not get through to me to answer the questions, um, I'm sure that we'll find a way of looking at your questions, and if we can get back to you, we'll do that. But join me again, and let's continue to engage with the hashtag, hashtag John Mahama Live. I'll be back with you again soon. Thank you very much.